of Revelation uh, chapter 12. Uh, Revelation, uh, the 12th chapter. As I said, this subject today, as well as the one we're going to look at on Sabbath, is going to tie in to God's special people. Uh, we said that God's special people, God's church, His body, has at its foundation the Word of God. Paul says it is Christ and the apostles, the prophets. This is what we are building upon. And when he says the apostles and the prophets and Christ being that chief cornerstone, it is actually referring to the teachings of the prophets, the teachings of the apostles, those whom God has sent by his spirit to bring to us the words of of life and it is Christ who is who is the center of the book that brings the teachings together they must be centered in Christ and what he longs to do for us and for others here we are in revelation 12 revelation 12 the bible tells us in revelation the 12th chapter and we're looking at verse 17 revelation 12 verse 17 the bible says and the dragon satan the that 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 power that he will use and at the end of time it says and the dragon was wroth or angry with the woman the church a woman in prophecy is synonymous with a church. Uh, God often likens his church to this, to a calmly and delicate woman, not calmly in the sense of outward exterior, but calmly in the sense that she is beholding Christ. She is reflecting the image of God. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah 53, that Jesus, he would be despised. They would see nothing in him that was comely. Now again, not speaking of his countenance per se, but it is speaking of his way of life, his, 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 his teachings would not be accepted. And so it here, the Bible says, she is comely, not because of her own beauty, as it is in Ezekiel 16, but her beauty, her comeliness comes from Christ. That same beauty, that same comeliness that the world despised then, and brothers and sisters, don't be fooled, that true biblical Christianity is still being despised today. It is not popular to walk with Christ in the world, and many of you are finding even in the church. So it says, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep, notice, the commandments of God and have what? The testimony of Jesus Christ. And we looked, if you were with the Sabbath, and we'll go there now, Revelation 19.10, what is this testimony of Jesus? What is it, brothers and sisters? You're going to Revelation 19 and verse 10. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 10. I'll start in 9. Revelation 19. What is this testimony? That God says that, that, that his people, his church, his one body, what is this testimony that she bears that would cause the dragon or the devil to be angry with her? What is this testimony? Revelation 19, beginning in verse 9, emphasis is verse 10. It says, And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to 
worship him, the angel he wanted to worship. And the angel said unto him, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have what? The testimony of Jesus, of which the dragon hates, going on, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is what? The spirit of prophecy. So here we find that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Where is this or who has this spirit of prophecy, brothers and sisters? It is found among the brethren, speaking of the church. But the question is, does or, or does every one of the brethren have this gift of prophecy? Does everyone, as it were, among the brethren, among God's church, do they have singular, each of them, the gift of prophecy? Notice what it says here, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, John again falls at the angel's feet as he sees these things. He's told not to do it. But then it says in verse 9, Revelation 22 and verse 9, it says, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren, the what? The prophets. And of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. So who is it? Who are the brethren, who are among the brethren that have this gift of prophecy? It is the prophets. It is the prophets, brothers and sisters. Now we understand, and we talked about this last week, so we won't go there, but I'll give it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, verse 4, down to verse 11. The Spirit of God, He divides the gifts among the brethren. It says, are all prophets? No, all are not prophets. He gives some one gift and some another. So can anyone who desires the gift have the gift? No, brothers and sisters. Like we said last Wednesday and like we said last Sabbath, it is not as though that there is a committee meeting somewhere in the church deciding on who gets the gift. You cannot go to a college or an institution and receive the gift of prophecy. God can use you and can put a word in thy mouth, but that does not make you in the fullest sense a prophet. Because we find in the Old Testament when Saul, who was being troubled by an evil spirit, when he came among Samuel and the other sons of the prophets, he began, the Bible says, to prophesy. And the question was asked, is Saul among the prophets? Is, is the son of Kish one of the prophets? God can give not only you a word, but God can also give or, or can put a word in a false prophet's mouth to tell the truth. God is no respecter of persons, but that does not make that one a prophet as in the fullest sense as God's prophets. Satan can put words in one's mouth. Satan can speak truth as long as it is intertwined with error. Now, we recognize, brothers and sisters, that the Bible tells us that one of an identifying mark among God's people is they keep the commandments and they have this gift. What gift? They have, they have the testimony of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, spirit of prophecy. Who has it? The prophets have it. Now, I want us to understand when we consider this gift. Go in your Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I want us to notice what the Bible tells us in verse 9, second, no, verse 19, 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 19, 2 Peter 1 and verse 19. When we understand how the spirit 
of God works. Oftentimes, not just today, but from the days of Moses all the way till now, you find that the people whom the devil was able to sow seeds in their minds, they always questioned the authority of God's prophets. God's prophets, their words have always been questioned from the beginning of time. They have always been chided. They have always been, as it were, trying to, or labeled as, trying to set themselves above the people of God, trying to set themselves in a place where the church began to feel that they did not belong. And they would often use God as a pretext for trying to neutralize and trying to negate the words that are burning upon their unrepentant hearts. So when you find individuals today trying to contest and to uh, uh, minimize the, uh, uh, God's words today, just know that this is that old serpent called the devil and Satan. His tricks have not changed. Notice, brothers and sisters, 2 Peter 1 and verse 19, it says this, We have also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, unto the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts. Notice, knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture. So when he's talking about when, when, when Peter is saying that we have a more sure word of prophecy, what is he speaking about? Is he talking about his writings? Is he talking about what he just wrote? No, brothers and sisters. Is he talking about what, 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 what John the apostle or the disciple would write in the gospel of John? No, he wasn't talking about that. In the context, he was talking about the Old Testament. He was talking about the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel. You get the point. He was talking about the Old Testament. He was talking about those writings of Moses when he was referring that we have a more sure word. So what he was saying was, he says, listen, even now, what I, oh, wait a minute, back up, back up. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Look at this. Notice what it says. Notice what it says. I want us to begin in verse 16. Verse 16, follow the point. For we have not, notice what he says, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Watch this. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were what? eyewitnesses of his majesty. Wait a minute. Peter says, we have not followed commonly devised fables. Notice, when we presently made known unto you the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He jumps down to verse 19 and he says, listen, we have a more sure word. Now, context. What is he saying? He's pointing you not to what he says, but to what was said. So wait a minute. Is Peter somehow exalting the writings of the Old Testament above that which he is now forecasting? Oh, brothers and sisters, he is. This is one of the qualities of a true prophet. A one who is moved by God never tries to exalt themselves above what God has already written because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14 that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Write down in your Bible, write down if you're taking notes, John 5 verse 46 and 47. What does Jesus say there? Jesus says, if you don't believe Moses' writings, how shall you believe my words? He goes on to say, because he wrote of me, but if you don't, but if you reject his words, then you will not receive my 
sayings. So what was Christ saying there in John 5, 46 and 49, 46 and 47? What he was saying was the reason why you are rejecting what God is now sending to you is because you have rejected what God has already sent to you. Well, the Bible tells us, write this in your notes as well, Luke 24 and verse 19, where the Bible says that Jesus was a prophet mighty indeed. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that Jesus as a prophet says you cannot receive this prophet if you reject those prophets. Could it be that's why you find so many people rejecting the spirit of prophecy today because they have already rejected the prophets of old. Oh, brothers and sisters, I'm, the word of God lets us know what you and I are contending with. We're not contending with people who, who are just who, who just look at what God says today and say, you know what? I can't. It's because they don't accept what is already said. They don't accept what God has already written. Therefore, as God begins to bring the light closer to them, they turn and they despise it. When you find the children of Israel, when they were there at the base of Mount Sinai, they rejected God when he spoke in an audible voice from Mount Sinai. And so there is no wonder that they rejected Moses. Why? Because if they're not going to hear God saying, then they're surely not going to hear God's prophet. And so you find this same pretext. You find this same a confusion and this time that has always been whenever you find someone trying to trying to minimize God's prophet today it is because they are following the same logic of that old serpent called the devil and Satan no matter how how naive they try to pretend and no matter how much they even tried to use their own prophet's writings to, 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 to reject what is being said. Someone could take this passage that we're looking at in 2 Peter and say, see, Peter says there's a more sure word. Peter, we don't necessarily have to focus on what Peter said. I can just focus on what Moses said. Because didn't Peter, after all, say that we have a more... Hmm... Now, you know, it's interesting, brothers and sisters, we wouldn't say that today. Well, at least some wouldn't say that today, but I'm sure. Now, let's go back. Let's 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 jump back for a moment. Let's jump back for a moment. Go with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter five. Let's go back to Acts chapter five. Let's see. Let's see that 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 that, that Peter, that people accept Peter's writings. You're going to the book of Acts and you're going to Acts chapter five. Brothers and sisters, I want you to, to, to notice what happens uh, when Peter and John are, 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 are brought before Annas and, and, and Caiaphas. I want you to notice what it says in Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse, let's see, just so you know who we're talking about here, let's go to Acts chapter 5 and let's begin at verse 17. And then we'll jump down to verse 21. Well, now 17, and then we'll go to 24, and then we'll jump over um, to 27 and 28. Well, watch this, brothers and sisters. You're in Acts 5. Now, we, we haven't finished 2 Peter, so keep your finger there. We're going to come back. Here it is. Acts 5, 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. They laid hold of the apostles, had them put in prison. Jump down now. Uh, to verse 24. 
All of a sudden, an angel came and freed them, let them out of prison, and the angel literally told them to go and do what the council had told them not to do. Let's jump down. You're in verse 24. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. And so they went and called them. They didn't, they didn't bring them all roughly. They brought them peacefully because they, they didn't want an uproar to be, uh, to be made among the people. And notice what it says. Jump over to verse 27. And when they had brought them, they sat them before the council. And the high priest asked them. Now, keep in mind, brothers and sisters, Stephen had not been stoned at this point. Probation had not yet closed on the church. Just a little food for thought. Verse 28, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not what? Teach in this name. Let's keep moving. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with what? Your doctrines. You filled Jerusalem with your Doctor. In other words, we don't subscribe to this particular teaching. At least we don't, we don't esteem it the way we do the writings of Moses. As a matter of fact, let me just jump to John 7 very quickly. Just jump to uh, John chapter 9, not 7, but John chapter 9. Watch this. I read this to you the other day, but I'll read it again. John chapter 7. John chapter 9, John chapter 9, begin in verse 27, John the ninth chapter, verse 27, and then we're going to go back to 2 Peter. We want to get somewhere. We're going somewhere, but put these things down, brothers and sisters, and see that the same things that you and I find ourselves contending with, with people who, who feel as though that they have a right conception of what and how to accept the truth Today, you know that you're contending with reason that has not newly come up, but it is old era. You're in John 9, John 9, 27. Pharisees wanted to know, who opened your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore, should I, wherefore you should, would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Verse 28. Then they reviled him and said, This thou art what? His disciple, but we are what? Moses' disciple. Verse 29. For, watch this, for, it says, we know, verse 29, we know that God spake what? Unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. Now, wait a minute. So we understand something is that they, 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 they said, we believe in Moses. We believe in the Old Testament. We don't necessarily need his teachings if we just hold on to Moses. Aren't we hearing the same thing today? We don't need those writings. All we need is the Bible. Look, she says all we need is the Bible. Look, Jesus says you need uh, uh, he opened their understanding in that which Moses said. Um, um, Peter says that we have a more sure word of prophecy. Peter's writings are more, uh, uh, the Old Testament is more sure than what even Peter said. So they would reject what God had brought to them presently with the pretext of trying to hold to that which they already had. And we find the same thing today. No, 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 no. We don't need that. We have our Bibles. After all, isn't it that we, is, doesn't she say that we need, and so we're confused. But no, brothers and sisters, they're not confused. It is the leaven that has been sown into their minds, and that's why many people are rejecting what God is seek, telling, saying to the churches today. Jesus' testimony is alive and it is active, but it is being disregarded and unheeded, therefore, they, 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 they try to hold, as it were, to the Word of God as though the Spirit is not the same Spirit. Let's go back to Second Peter chapter 1. 
Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1. So when we look at a prophet, we look at the church, God's church. God's church will have the testimony of Jesus. Where will this testimony come from? It will come from the prophet. Well, can't anyone give this testimony? Is it possible for me to go to school and get a degree in math and a, a math, become a master of divinity? Isn't it possible for me to, to go to my apostle or my bishop and let them pray over me and give me the gift? I mean, after all, then the Bible said about Timothy that that the, the, the gift that was in him and, and that was laid on uh, uh, and the presbytery of the leadership laid their hands upon him. Is it so is it so can I go to my bishop and sit up under my bishop and all of a sudden have this gift? Well, brothers and sisters, we understand Paul said this gift that was in thee, it was in thee. The brethren came together and put their hands on Timothy to signify that they recognized the gift that was in him, brothers and sisters. God gave the gift. The brethren separated Paul, not because they wanted to, but because the Spirit of God said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas. It was the Spirit that did that. Why? Because you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians 4, that God gives gifts. He gives some, not all. So all do not have. You cannot go to your elder and your bishop or your apostle or whoever and say, give me this gift. It doesn't happen that way. Well, wait a minute. You may say, well, what about Elijah and Elisha? Didn't he ask for a double portion? But brothers and sisters, who was it that told Elijah to go and get Elisha? It was God that told him. It was God and the spirit that came upon him, though it was recognized as the spirit of Elijah, it was the spirit and the power of Christ, brothers and sisters. So we understand that, again, even when you look at John the Baptist, they said he would come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Luke says Elias is Elijah. But the reality is you find that Elizabeth, she received the Holy Ghost from her, that, that the child was anointed with the Holy Ghost while he was still in his mother's womb. So was it the spirit and power of Eli Elijah? It would be identified as the work that Elijah did, but it was the spirit of God. It is not this innate power that the prophets have. It is something that is given by God. All right. So now we find that the spirit of prophecy Peter says that you and I have this more sure word, this, this, this. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Where does he point to these prophecies as? He points to them as being found in the scriptures. Let's continue to go on. Now notice what it says. Verse 19 again. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well to take heed, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Verse 20, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is what? Of any private interpretation. So it's not what you think. It's not what I think. It's not what he thinks or she thinks. It's what the word of God says. You and I must search the scriptures. If one believes that he is called to be a prophet, then he is subject to that which is taught in the word of God. It is not something that is secret. It is not something that that that. Uh, uh, that does not harmonize with the word of God. Therefore, the Bible tells us, write down Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20, where God says, if they speak not according to this word, if they don't speak according to what is written in the word, it is because there is no light to the law 
and to the testimony. What testimony? The testimony of Jesus. What is the testimony of Jesus? The spirit of prophecy. If they don't speak concerning what is written by God, it is because there is no light. There is no prophecies that we should look to for them to receive any, any enlightenment or education because they reject the law and the testimony of the prophets that have come before. Of the prophets that have come before. Now notice, so here the Bible says that it says that there is no prophecy of any private interpretation. Verse 1. Verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Watch this. But holy men of God speak as they were moved by whom? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Now, I want us to understand something. That we see the operation of the Spirit. And we are told that brothers and sisters of the world cannot receive the Spirit of God. Why? Because it cannot see Him. Therefore, the Spirit of God manifests Himself through the gifts that are demonstrated in the church. And as they see the development of these gifts, as they see the unity of the church, as they see the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, goodness, meekness, when they see these gifts, temperance, when they see these gifts being manifested in the church and the fruit, Galatians 5.22, being demonstrated by its members, this is how they will believe that the testimony in which we bear is from God. This is how they will know that we are of God. This is how they will know that God is truth. So now, brothers and sisters, I want us, I want us to look at, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Go with me in your Bibles uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want us to understand again, why is this gift? of prophecy, why is this testimony so needed for the church today? Now, Ephesians 4, we looked at that, so I'm kind of skipping over it, but Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, verse 8, verse 11, down to verse 14. All right, Ephesians 4 and verse 8. Preacher, why are you skipping verse 9 and 10? Because 9 and 10 talks about that we need not call Jesus down, neither need we call him up from the grave. And thus, but we understand that when Jesus ascended up on high, he led a multitude of captives and he gave gifts unto men. What were these gifts? Verse 11 says, he begins to describe what these various gifts are. Pastoring, evangelism, apostleship, uh, um, prophets, teachers. These are some of the, these are the gifts that are described. And then it says, what are the gifts for? For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. So the gifts are given for the edifying of the body, bringing us to the, the, leading us to grow up to the full stature of men and women in Christ Jesus, that we henceforth be no more men tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. The gifts are given by God to stand, as it were, as sentinels, as watchmen that would keep winds of doctrine from scattering God's people to the four winds. But what have we seen? We have not seen these gifts manifested as they ought to. 
as we said on, on, on Sabbath, Saturday, we said that we still see the offices, but we don't see the gifts of the Spirit. Because today, pastors are made pastors, not because the Spirit of God has called them, not because that they can bear witness of the Spirit's power, not because they have seen how God's providence has led them step by step. They have learned, the, they have learned to fear God by the precepts of men. They have learned about Jesus through a rumor. They have learned about him through what others have said. And so they have read this book. They have read that book. They have, they have uh, 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 um, gone to this class. They have studied this and they have studied that, but they have not studied their Bibles. And as a result of that, many of them are being made pastors because their uncle was a pastor. Their grandfather was a pastor. And why not? I'll be a pastor. And, and, and they're made a pastor because this relative or because that friend or that person has an inside connection and because this person knows how to hoot and, and this person knows how to run and this person, uh, uh, for whatever reason, he, you know, uh, uh, tried to live a life out in the streets and it didn't work. God drew him to himself. And just because he was a part of the Illuminati, now all of a sudden he feels that he's qualified to have a quote unquote ministry in the church. I used to be a dancer. Well, I used to be an opera singer. I used to be a junkie. I used to be whatever. And because of all these things, we believe and the church has says, well, come rule over us. Come almost like the bramble saying to the olive tree, come rule over us. And we just been calling people into the church and saying, hey, you come and teach us. And so you have all these various people operating in the office of the gifts, but they have not received the anointing to operate in that office. And so now many people are confused when they look at God's church because they say, wow, he's a pastor. Therefore, I can't believe that he would do this. But you don't understand, brothers and sisters. They were not separated for the, gift, the, the, for the office. They were not prepared to operate in the gift. They just went to school. They just got a certificate. And now they walk around in the office of a pastor consuming all the different uh, uh, luxuries and gifts and perks that comes with a pastor. Almost like Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Gershom. They've not been anointed by God, but because they were married in, they were put in the office and those whom God called were actually set aside. And so we find that we understand that God gave these gifts to the church and the testimony of God's spirit is what really guides the gifts. It guides the gifts. You have the various different members of the body, but all of a sudden you need that testimony of God's spirit. You need that breath of life to come into and cause the body to live. And this is what the testimony of Jesus is given for. This is why the church is in the condition because it has rejected the breath of life for its soul. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. The Bible says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God, which is given you by Jesus Christ. Verse 5, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance, in all knowledge. Verse 6, even as, watch this, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that ye come behind in what? No gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. The testimony of Jesus was confirmed so that we come behind in no gift. Wait a minute. So that is, it is the testimony of Jesus 
that confirms the gifts that are to be seen and how they are to function so that we come behind in nothing, doing what? Waiting for the coming of the Lord. Waiting for the coming of the Lord. Now the question is, the gift of prophecy, how early in the church's history do we see this gift? Was this gift only given to us at Pentecost? Is this when the gift of prophecy began to be seen among God's church? Well, let's see what the Bible says, brothers and sisters. Well, we already got a hint and we already, we already understand that no, Pentecost did not necessarily begin these gifts because we read, we read in Paul, we read Peter's writings where it says, the more should a word of prophecy, no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation. He's pointing back to those scriptures, to the Old Testament. Notice what it says though. Let us go in our Bibles. Let's see. Where shall we go first? Hmm. I want us to notice what the Bible says. Uh, let's look at, well, since we're in the New Testament, let's stop by the New Testament for a moment. Let's see what the Bible says in the book of uh, Acts. Let's go to Acts. Um, let's see. Do we want two? Or do we want, let's see, let's Acts chapter 2. We'll take Acts chapter 2. And I want you to notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 29. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 29. 29, reading down to verse 30. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 29. The question is, do we see the gift of prophecy? being exercised only in the New Testament. Is this the first place where we begin to see the testimony of Jesus being confirmed among the church? Notice what our Bible says, uh, beginning in verse 29, Acts 2, beginning in verse 29. Notice what the Bible says. It says, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Verse 30, uh, that was 29. Verse 30 says, therefore, watch this, being a prophet. And knowing that God has sworn in an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ, not Solomon, Christ to sit on his throne. So the Bible says that David was a prophet. But let's go back even a little further. Go in your Bibles to the book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation. Let's go to our Bibles to the book of Jude. Let's see this, brothers and sisters. Let's go in our Bibles to the book of Jude. Uh, the Bible tells us here in the book of Jude, beginning at verse 14. Jude, verse 14. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Jude, verse 14. It says, and Enoch also, notice, the seventh from Adam. What did he do? He prophesied of these saying. Wait a minute. So Jude is saying that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied as to what Jude said we're seeing in the church now. He said, he said Enoch prophesy concerning these individuals. So brothers and sisters, we realize right here that we see the gift of prophecy as far back as the days of Adam. We see the gift of prophecy as far back as then. Well, when we look at this gift of prophecy, we see that Abraham was a prophet. We 
You find in the book of Psalms, I believe it's Psalms 105, where he says that God says, touch, uh, uh, do my prophet, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. Speaking of Abraham, Abraham was a prophet of God. And as we move through our time, Moses was a prophet. Matter of fact, let's go in our Bibles and let's look at that in, re in, uh, regards, in regards to Moses. Notice what it says in the book of Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 63. Isaiah, the 63rd chapter. And I want you to notice what the Bible says concerning, concerning this gift of prophecy. Moses, brothers and sisters, being that prophet that God used. Notice what it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 63. We understand that the gift of prophecy was not seen, did not begin at the time of Pentecost. We see that this gift of prophecy was as was, was all the way back in doing even the time of Adam. God says that Enoch prophesied concerning the things that you said that they were seeing in the church at that time, even all the way down to the end, because Enoch prophesied that God was going to execute judgments. So Enoch not only saw the flood coming, but he prophesied of the flood of fire that would come at the end of time. This gift has always been with the people of God. It has always been there, brothers and sisters. These, these, these gifts have always been seen, but these gifts have always been rejected by the masses in the church. They have always been contested by a mixed multitude who found themselves among the people of God. Not only a mixed, but even those who were set apart for holy office, such as, such as Numbers. In Numbers chapter 16, we see, we see Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and the 250 nobles, men of renown, in the camp of Israel, who rose up against God's prophets. So it is no wonder when we see people today trying to neutralize, dumb down, and push aside God's prophet as though it has no relevancy for us today. We understand where that spirit is coming from, brothers and sisters. We know what we are contending with. We are not ignorant of the devil's devices. Notice what it says. You're in Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, notice what the Bible tells us in Isaiah 63. Let's start here and let's look in verse 11. Isaiah 63, verse 11, the Bible says this. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up, that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his what? Holy Spirit within him. It's talking about Moses, how he led the children of Israel out of Egypt like a shepherd, how God put his Holy Spirit in him. You say, well, wait a minute. That doesn't mean that he was a prophet, but it tells us here in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 12. Daniel, Hosea chapter 12. Notice what your Bible tells us here in Daniel and Hosea chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 13. Hosea 12 and verse 13. Write these things down, brothers and sisters. Hosea 12 and verse 13, it says, And by a prophet, God says, And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a what? Prophet was he preserved. So when God put his spirit in Moses, Moses was a prophet. Yes, he was a shepherd, but he was God's prophet. So what do we find? Korah, Dathan, Abiram. What do we find? Miriam and Aaron, or Miriam per se, doing 
in the wilderness, when they rose up against Moses, who were they rising up against? They were rising up the spirit of prophecy. They were trying to put aside God's messenger. God not only speaks through you, God can also speak through me. I have a master of divinity. I have gone to our institutions. I, I am a scholar of the highest order and I can detect and I can discern what is inspired and what is not. I am the, I am the authoritative source of how you ought to interpret the writings of the prophet. That's what was done back then. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you, that is what is being now. When Nicodemus came to Jesus, he says, we know you are a mat. He says, what, what, what? He says, we know that God is with you. We, we, we understand. We believe that God is with you. Because if he wasn't, then how can you do these things? But brothers and sisters, Nicodemus didn't believe him enough, enough to publicly confess him. Let's look at, let's, 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 well, we're not going to fast forward there. Just write down in your Bibles, John chapter 12, John chapter 12. I want to get to a point. When we look at the Bible and we look at this idea of the gift of prophecy, we have this thing in our minds because it has been put there, not by God, but by man, not by God, but by the devil. Man, the agent, the, 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 the power that works through the medium of theology, scholasticism, that causes one to doubt the words of God. Now, brothers and sisters, let's just, just let our minds just kind of pause for a moment. When we look at Moses and we look at Christ, we would say that there's no difference in their inspiration. Jesus himself says in John 5, we quoted it from John 5, verse 46 and 47. He said, if you don't believe Moses' writings, you're not going to believe my sayings. Prophets are subject to the prophets. Jesus was made, uh, uh, became like us. He didn't, he didn't, he moved from his, his throne and he was made like unto sinful man. Jesus became subject to man when he sat at the well asking for water. Jesus could have made call that water and that water would have came up like a fountain and flowed into his mouth and could have went back down and he would have satisfied his thirst. But Jesus became man to save man, to give us an example of what could happen in the human flesh if you would depend solely, wholly upon the Father. And so we find that when Jesus said, listen, if you won't believe Moses, you're going to reject my sayings. Well, this has been the condition throughout time. If you write down, you're taking notes, I want you to write down Jeremiah chapter 36. I want you to read what happened when Jeremiah sent the general conference president of his time, when he sent the king a letter that was, or, or words that was inspired by God and what did the king do with them? He took those sayings when he heard the brethren reading them and he took those things and he cut them things up with a knife and he threw it upon the fire. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to look at, I want us to, to notice something for a moment. I want us to go quickly in our Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Go in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Hmm. Deuteronomy chapter 4 is where we want. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Oh, brothers and sisters, there's nothing new under the sun. The devil, the devil uses the same things. If he can keep us from studying our Bibles, then we fall into this under the, the, the spell of the leaven of the scribes and of the Pharisees. We don't even believe there are preachers today who are preaching and have no idea that they are preaching doctrines of devils, not, I don't believe some of them, some of them, not willingly, but some of them are ignorant of the devil's devices. 
and they would refrain from using the prophet's words for fear of how the Pharisees and the scribes would dissect and, and seek to, to relegate uh, uh, and would seek to kind of neutralize and, 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 and stifle their message. Just like that text I gave you from John chapter 12. They believed on Jesus. In other words, Jesus was a prophet, uh, Luke, 9, Luke 24 and verse 19. So they believed in the testimony of Jesus. They believed in the spirit of prophecy. But it says, many of the Pharisees believed on him, uh, but they would not confess him. And it says they love, their, it, it, they love the praises of men more than that of God. They did not confess him openly. Why? Because they would be put out of the ministry if they taught his teachings, they would have been put out of the synagogues. Therefore, they remained quiet and they taught the way that they were taught in their rabbinical schools. They taught the way that they were taught in their seminaries. They taught the way that they were taught in their field schools. And so they teach this way because they don't want people to think that they differ from the scribes and Pharisees of their time. So they won't emphasize what the prophet says. But I want you to notice, brothers and sisters, this, this, uh, uh, the confusion that is on one's mind. So the question I ask, the writings of Moses and the writings of Christ, uh, um, we would say, and, and Christ is the inspiration, but he physically did not write a book in the Bible. But anyway, when we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, you would be hard-pressed to find a preacher today who would say that the inspiration of Moses differs from the inspiration of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. You would find very few that would, that would, that would argue that point. If you were to say, well, well what about the prophet um, uh, uh, Gad? What about the prophet Nathan, who was in the days of David? He was the one who came to David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and rebuked David for the sin of Bathsheba, the sin he committed with Bathsheba, and he rebuked him. He was a prophet of God. But would one, you would ask, is, is Nathan or Gad or Shemaiah these prophets, are, are, are their words any less inspirational than that of Isaiah? You would, find, um, you, would, you would be hard pressed to find a minister who would say, yes, I believe their inspiration is different. Some would look and say, no, it's the word, it's the word of God, it's the word of God. Why? You ask them why? Because holy men of God speak as they will move by the Holy Ghost. And God, and, the, and, and, and God is no respecter of person. He is the same today, yesterday, and he's the same forever. Where we see the word of God, it is the word of God. Now, but if you would say, well, if that's the case, then why is it that we would say that God has given to us a prophet today, but yet those writings are less inspirational and they, are, uh, they, are, they, they, they come with less authority than that of any other prophet that have preceded this prophet. And they would have to think for a moment and then they'll have to come up with all these various excuses to try to use the prophet to, to, to neutralize what is said there. Now I want you just to go here. You're in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Follow the point, brothers and sisters. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. I want you to notice what God tells Moses. He says, you, he says, ye shall not, ye shall not, what? Add unto the word which I command you. Neither shall ye diminish aught from it. Um, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, which I command you. Now let's go to chapter 12 and verse 32. So God says, do what? He says, do not add to that which I give you. Let's go to chapter 12. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 12. We're looking at verse 32. Deuteronomy chapter 12. I want you to notice what it says in verse 32. 
Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32. It says, What thing soever I command you, watch this, observe to do it. Thou shalt not what? Add thereto, nor diminish from it. So, question. God tells Moses on two occasions. God speaks once, yea, twice. Thing is established. God tells Moses on two separate occasions, do not add and don't diminish from what I'm saying. So the question is for us that we have to follow this logic through. If there was to be no addition to what God told Moses, then why do we have the book of Joshua? Why do we have Judges? Why do we have First and Second Samuel? Why do we have Ruth? Why do we have Nehemiah? Why do we have Isaiah and Daniel and Job and Ezekiel? Why do we have all these books? If God says, do not add and do not diminish. Were these men not quote unquote, adding to what Moses says. Now, again, a theologian will have to try to find a way to, 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 to make sense of all this rather than just using the word of God to show the clarity of God's word. Spiritual things, you know, spiritual things, spiritual things, line upon line, precept upon precept. Just go through the word of God and it explains itself. Now let's fast forward, brothers and sisters. Now, now write down uh, Deuteronomy 31 verses 24 to 26, because you find all that God gave Moses, he wrote it and he had it put in the side of the ark. That's Deuteronomy 31 verse 24 to 26. But you're going now with me quickly to Revelation 22. You're going to Revelation 22. And I want you to notice what it says in Revelation, the 22nd chapter. And you are looking at verse 19. Watch this. Revelation 18 and 19. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. And it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man what shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in these books. Verse 19, and if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Stop for a moment. We find John repeating the very thing that Moses said. Well, wait a minute. Is John kind of doing a safe face move so that no one would kind of contest what he says by saying don't add? But wait a minute. Moses said don't add. And between Moses and John, have mercy. But John comes back and John says don't add. Now, does this make sense or is this confusion? Does it make sense? or it is confusion. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to notice what the Bible says in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30. Notice what the Word of God says in Proverbs chapter 30. And I believe here will make sense for us. Proverbs chapter 30. Was God telling, saying Moses, there was to be no additional teachings that, would per, that was to come after what I'm telling you in these Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There was to be no more truth that would come. All, uh, this is all of what people needed. Brothers and sisters, I want you to notice. You're here in Proverbs 30, but I want you to write down Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 8, where God told Isaiah, he said, go note it in a book. God told Habakkuk in chapter 2, he says, write the vision and make it plain upon tables, parchment. In other words, Habakkuk, what I am telling you, put it in a book for others to read. Daniel chapter 12, what thou seest, seal it up, Daniel, put it in a book. It is for the time of the end. So we see prophets are writing, but wait a minute, Moses was already told that nothing was to be added. Why do we have all these additional books? If Moses was the, if, if when Moses wrote, that was the sealed, as it were, canon 
of the time, where did all these other prophets come? The canon was closed in the time of Moses, wasn't it? God says, Moses, don't add. Moses wrote, Joshua, put this in the side of the ark. That's where it was put. But brothers and sisters, when, when Moses died and just before Joshua died, Joshua added. He wrote and he told him to do what? Put it in the side of the ark. Put it in. Was he trying to exalt himself like Moses? Brothers and sisters, again, so when we look at the Word of God, we have to ask ourselves, then why is it that so many people believe that what God has given to us in these last days should not be taken, or, or let me see, it should be taken with a grain of salt? Why is, that, why is that being emphasized from the ministry today? Why are those who are standing in the, in the desk trying to minimize God's profit? Why is that? It's an old lie that the devil has been telling ever since the fall of man. Because if we follow their logic, and brothers and sisters, we have to reject everything after Moses. Everything after Moses would have to be rejected. If... We don't have understanding, but if we search the scriptures, we will find clarity. Notice what it says, Proverbs 30, Proverbs 30, verse 5. Notice, brothers and sisters, Proverbs 30. We would have to reject what we're about to read anyway, but notice what it says, Proverbs 30, verse 5. It says, every word of the Lord is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him, verse 6. Add thou not unto what? God's word. Watch this. Here's the key. Lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Wait a minute. So when God is telling us not to add, God is saying that that which is not in harmony with what I am saying is not to be reckoned with the word of God. What I have not inspired and directly shown, it is not to be reckoned on the same account with my words. Oh, my friends. So God is not telling, God is not saying that after Moses, the canon was closed. God is not even telling us that after the book of Revelation, the canon is closed and sealed. Brothers and sisters, God has light for his people in this our day. Let's look here very quickly. Let's go to one more text. I thought that would be it, but let's go to another text. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Oh, my friends, look, brothers and sisters, you say, well, wait a minute. Why is it that, 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 that I read and I understand that I'm constantly being told that I must go back to the word of God? The same way, brothers and sisters, when Isaiah was around, Isaiah kept telling you to go back to the writings of Moses. The same way when Christ was around, he kept telling you to go back to the Old Testament. The same way when the apostles were around, they kept sending you back to the Old Testament. That is a qualification of the Spirit. Because Christ says, when he comes, when he comes, he shall not speak of himself, but that which he hear shall he speak. He will glorify me. The prophets never came to lift up and glorify themselves. That did not diminish what they were saying. No, brothers and sisters, God has given to us a prophet through the ministry of Ellen White. And yes, her writings are constantly pointing us back to the greater light, which is Christ. But in still, it does not diminish aught of what is said there. In. It does not make her less, brothers and sisters, than Isaiah or Jeremiah. If Isaiah was around, then Isaiah, brothers and sisters, would have took the writings of Moses and he would have put everything else around it. Just like Moses, watch this, when he wrote what he said, he put it on the side around the law of God. Because what he said pointed you to the law of God. Come on. So when you look at the word of God, 
the Spirit of God, the Spirit of prophecy, God's prophet, they are constantly to point you back to Christ. John says, I am not that light, but I've come to bear witness of the light. John, he whom you were with on the other side of Jordan, he baptized if it make his disciples. John said, I already told you that he must increase and I must decrease. That is the purpose of a prophet. But because Satan has sown his seeds of rebellion in our hearts, we look for any excuse to reject the plain teachings of the Word of God. The same ones that will reject the prophet of God today are the same ones that you will find rejecting the principles of the Word of God. They don't want to abide by it. They don't live by it. They, 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 they push it off as not being essential. The Word of God says that an elder should be the husband of one wife. They twist it, mutilate it, mash it up, and throw it aside. They don't follow this. So, brothers and sisters, why do you think they will follow that? I told you before, when people have a problem with the direction that people are going in the church, they don't grab the Word of God and say, you know, brothers and sisters, no, they go and, grab a book, uh, go and grab something like a manual. They go and grab a creed. They stand up before the assembly and they constantly read from their creeds. It happens in the Baptist church, happens in the Presbyterian church, happens in the Catholic church. It happens everywhere. Everyone has their catechism that they want to abide by, but no one wants to stand upon the Word of God except those who keep the commandments of God have the testimony of Jesus. Notice here, as we close, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. How long would this gift be with us, brothers and sisters? Did it end with us in the days of John? Did it end during that time, A.D. 96? They believe somewhere around then was the book of Revelation written. And John, after he left the Isle of Patmos, he wrote the first and second and third epistle of John. And so John died somewhere, somewhere along that time, maybe 100 AD, maybe a little before, maybe a little after, somewhere around there. And so when John said, don't add, as it were, sealing like Moses did, was God saying that there, would to, there was to be no more inspired light for the people of God in these last days. Well, Revelation 12 said, said there would be, but let's see what Paul says. Let's see what Paul says. John was around longer than Paul, but notice what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want us, I want us to look at these scriptures. Let's start in verse, verse 9. Verse 9. Let's see, will the gift of prophecy, how long would this gift abide with us? 1 Corinthians 13, verse 9, it says this, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be what? Done away. Let's stop for a moment. So that tells us here, that Jesus, that our prophecies were prophesying in part, there's still some more to come. But when Jesus comes, prophecy shall be done away, or prophesying shall be complete. What need is there to prophesy when that which is perfect is come, and that which is perfect is come is Jesus. So what does that tell us about the gift of prophecy? What does that tell us about the what does that tell us about the spirit of prophecy? What does that tell us about the testimony of Jesus? It will be around all the way until Jesus comes. So in this last days, we need the testimony of Jesus. Now, more than ever before, brothers and sisters, we need this gift more than we have ever needed it before. If we've ever needed the spirit of prophecy, it is now that we need it. But oh, my friends, and all thy getting, we need understanding. Too often, many people don't have understanding. And what they know about God, they learned it from somebody else. Brothers and sisters, let that not be your case. 
Let, that, let it not be said of you that what you know, you know it because that you have been tuning in to EG Bible School. Let it not be your testimony that you know what you know because of man. You know what you know, brothers and sisters, because with his spirit you have searched the scriptures. For in them you think, in them, brothers and sisters, is where eternal life will shine upon your pathway. Brothers and sisters, there, this subject is, is, can, can go for days, for months, just looking into this subject. Brothers and sisters, we need to study it. This is another identifying mark of God's people in these last days. This coming Sabbath, as we look at our next subject, which will tie into this subject, which will tie into the subject from last week, and we will be able to identify who God's special people are. We find here that we need the spirit of prophecy. We need the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy does not come in degrees. Does not say, okay, well, uh, Jude only wrote one book, so Jude is not to be taken on the same level as Isaiah. As a matter of fact, Isaiah was before Jude, so we shouldn't listen to Jude, no. But Jude's writings are tested by what was said before him because the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. God told Moses, Deuteronomy 18, that I will raise up a prophet like unto you, Peter says, Acts chapter 3, that that prophet that Moses was speaking about was Jesus. Him shall you hear. But wait a minute. If the canon was closed, if, at, if, if God meant that no more light should come, then why should we look for a prophet? Why should we give heed to what Isaiah said? Didn't God tell Moses not to add? We don't need to listen to Isaiah. We don't need to listen to Jeremiah. They're lesser prophets. Some things, yeah, you know, it's okay. And, and we try to get into all this. And, and brothers and sisters, let me tell you a trick of the devil as we close. The devil uses men to try to so humanize divinity that it loses its appeal. Meaning, what, what, the heathens would do in ancient times, they would try to turn the glory of God into an ox that eateth grass, David said. Or we had tried, they, 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 or they would turn it into some, some debauched statue, or they would turn it into some figure of man, or they would turn it into this, or, or they would make some painting of it. Therefore, your conception, your conception of divinity was, was, was relegated to that painting or to that image. And therefore, your concept of God was relegated to a position, and it would not go anywhere else. Thus, you can control what you think about that image of God that you have relegated to that position. What man does today? We take what God does and we still make images. We just, we call them autobiographies. Uh, we try to do our best to take God's prophets and try to humanize them. In other words, as though we don't know that God's prophets are humans. The Bible says that, that, that uh, uh, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as he are, yet we prayed. But what do we want to do? We want to take the prophet and, and we want to uh, show the prophet uh, laying, uh, 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 um, eating and, and, and sitting on the porch and, you know, drinking tea and, and, and dipping her cookies in milk. And, 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 and we want to give all these, we want to try to come up with these most humanistic aspects that we can of the prophet. But at the same time, the devil is causing individuals who are not privy to his devices to look upon the prophet with less of the authority that is due to what God says. And so you have all these individuals writing these books about the prophet, trying to dissect her life. 
And so we go and visit the prophet's home and we see where she would sit and where she would write. And, and then we would look over here and we would see, okay, well, this was her furniture. And, and we would look and see, okay, this is where she went and got coffee. And she used to like to go out here and, 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 and pick flowers. And, and she would go over here and sunbathe and, and our children. And we, and we humanize. And before you know it, it's just a person in our minds. We always knew it was a person. But the authority and the weight that it should have is lost. The sense of responsibility to what God has been telling us has been diminished. And it's, an, and it's a device of the devil to keep us, brothers and sisters, from esteeming the words that God has given to us. Brothers and sisters, Satan is seeking to leaven our minds. The devil himself said, if we would read and believe these words, he could have little hope of overcoming us. This is why he keeps people so far from these words. This is why, brothers and sisters, he has people reading all these compilations and are confused about what God is calling for his people to do. This coming Sabbath, I pray the God that you tune in for our midday service so that you can understand where and who God's special people is. And if you have yet to find them, then by the grace of God, this last piece of the puzzle, you would be able to find God's special people. Brothers and sisters, I pray to God that you would look over these scriptures that you would go back and that you would do like the Bereans and that you would search to see whether or not these things are so. Father in heaven, we pray.